discretion is advised. Hey everyone, this video is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering you a free audiobook with a 30-day free trial membership. All you need to do is go to audibletrial.com forward slash bgunlocked. The link is in the description below, and now enjoy the video. Hey everyone, welcome back to Board Games Unlocked, and today I'm doing a pretty fun top 10. Not that all my top 10s aren't fun, but this is going to be top 10, uh, I titled it Under the Radar Games. So these are games that I think are really, really good, but for some reason or another they just got no, you know, super, like, hype. They didn't, they didn't just fly, like, into social media and just, like, everyone was just creaming over them. Like, they just were made and immediately forgotten. Or not even talked about at all, to my knowledge. Now, how I came up with my games uh, were, like, I went on Board Game Geek and kind of ranked, I went from... 3,000, like their Board Game Geek ranking, like the numbers, so like, for example, Gloomhaven is number one, um, and I, I went from 3,000 all the way to 10,000, that's as far as I went, because at that point I was like, look, I'm sure there's some some game that I've played, but that's, that's further than that, but it's not, I'm probably not going to have liked it, so... So yeah, this one's going to be pretty cool, because I'm going to give some recognition to some games I think that are really, really neat, and uh, I'll probably talk about maybe why they, I, don't, I feel like they didn't get the recognition they deserve. So, without further ado, let's get started with an honorable mention, and this is a game that kind of had, I feel like I'm hitting puberty, uh, that kind of had a gimmick around it, and two games, to my knowledge, came out with this gimmick, and they both came out around the same time. And the game is Rattle Battle Grab the Loot. Now, the other game, Pirates of the Seven Seas, I absolutely despised. I hated uh, pretty much everything about that. Uh, but Rattle Battle Grab the Loot, I thought was a really, really fun game. Like, so what you do, the gimmick, is you took a whole bunch of dice like your dice that represented your pirate ships and the mission that you were trying to complete, they had specific dice and then your enemies uh, also had their dice and you would shake them up and then you would just drop them into the, the game board. And the insert actually had like some really ni nice artwork that would show like the ocean and maybe some terrain and things like that. And basically how they dropped is kind of how you fought. And this was a very beer and pretzels game. You, you could not take it seriously at all. And then you would, uh, like, you know, whatever your higher number was, or you actually had, like, your own ship that you were building, that if you needed to move, you could spend, like, a sail, or if you wanted to attack, you had cannons, and then you could shoot, and, like, oh, hey, I have this special cannon, or I have this drill. And it was all very whimsical, wonky stuff that you could have on your ship, like, accessories. So it's like, hey, if I move and run into someone, it actually destroys the die because it, I have, like, a saw blade. And so, if that was it, then that'd be really awful. But the second half of the game was you basically gathered a bunch of, you know, uh, loot that you would spend at, at port. So you can hire people that would give you victory points or some special ability. You could get some, you know, treasures that would, as you know, it was kind of in a stack. So if you bought one, then the next one was going to be more expensive. And those were end game victory points. And then you... uh like could also buy accessories and make your ship bigger. So I really like this game a lot. And I actually, I need to figure out what, what number it was because I don't quite remember off the top of my head. But it's, it was just fun. Like it was super gimmicky. I really like the gimmick. I like the second half. And while well, the game might be a little bit long and it was made by Portal Games, surprisingly, I just... I don't know why. I don't know why. I think just people didn't like the randomness or the luck aspect. They felt that, like, and I get, I get that. There is absolutely no luck to this game in any way. Or any any strategy to this game in any way. But, yeah, like, I, I thought it was fun. So if you want a fun, piratey, you know, shipbuilding game and, you know, just want to have some fun and just, you know, it'd be all about luck, check out Rattle Battle Grab the Loot. My number 10 was ranked... 3,351, and this was a game that was kind of a, it was a head-to-head -head game made by Level 99 called Cell Swords, and they made a second one called Cell Swords Odyssey, which kind of dealt with, you know, um, you know, Zeus and the, uh, those kind, those types of gods, which I'm totally drawing a blank on, uh, Greek gods, and 
what you do with this, this is actually a pretty good puzzle head-to-head -head game is that each card has has two sides you have a, a red side and then a blue side and what you're doing is they all have like special abilities and they also have like numbers ar around like each of the edges and that represents their strength so what you're doing is like basically you're playing a card down and then you have your opponent who will also play their card down inside in kind of an adjacent area and then can match strength and then if your strength is bigger than theirs or vice versa then that card flips over to their color so if i'm playing red your your essential goal is to have one is to have more of you, the cards flipped to your side than theirs and that's why they're like sell swords is because they're like they're they're not loyal to any one side so it's like oh, okay well i'm winning now so they're joining my side and i thought this was a really neat and fun puzzle game because you get points and it, like the game lasts two rounds so you get points based off of how many of yours are in a, a row so like if you and the points go up so it's like if you have one uh of your color in a row you get one point if you have two you get three and and, and so on and so forth but what makes this game very puzzly is the special abilities of the the card so there are some where it's like you it, like he could have a really really high strength but he doesn't flip anyone that he he fights against or like if you have an archer then you can play him and you don't have to fight the person that you played him next to you can fight one that's like two spaces away and things like that and what's really neat is you draft the people that you are wanting to use and so you you can easily read what your opponents might still have in their hand and be like okay so how are they going to like how are they going to use the the cell swords that they've that they've hired and uh, am i going to be able to constantly flip because where you place is going to matter because you can't just place them anywhere the the grid I believe has to be in a five by five grid so it can only go five long so at some point you're not even gonna like if you place someone then you're like okay like i'm not gonna be able to flip them back if they get flipped and this was a really cool it's a small game and i mean the the first one is actually people from their indines world so it's kind of set in their you know the battle con exceed kind of world but the uh the odyssey one was you know just greek gods and things like that so you can kind of pick whichever one you want uh and what's also neat is you're kind of battling on certain terrain so you actually start the board on where it's like it's like a terrain card so it could be yggdrasil as the as the first one and that will have its own special ability and kind of how you score and uh you know certain placement rules and so there's a bunch of those in both of the different games that will alter how the game is being played it's just really neat. It's one that I've kept in my collection. Um, I'm not surprised that it flew under the radar. Like, I don't know how this compares to other types of... I mean, to, I, can, I know how it compares to other, like, strategy 1v1s, like Onitama or something. But I don't think it's that kind of game. The game is very light, but still has enough of a think element where you're not going to just be like, wow, this is a very obvious move. You're going to be thinking, you know, and kind of trying to get it to the head of your opponent. And the games go by so quick that you're kind of be like, oh, okay, let's start again, because, you know, you might get some really cool combos of the cards that you're getting. So, I really like it. Cell Swords, my number 10. By the way, I have done a run-through. I've done a run-through for Rattle Battle Grab the Loot, so you can check that out. I've also done a run-through for Cell Swords, and I believe I did Cell Swords Odyssey in that same run-through. So, you can, you can check that out. My number nine, I've also done a run through for, and this is ranked 5,564, a Kickstarter game with, once again, another gimmick. I think that might be the ultimate reason why a lot of these games fly under the radar, is people don't tend to like gimmicky games. Like, if you play them, then you're like, oh yeah, that was fun. Uh, but you're like, oh, I'm not going to go out of my way, because gimmicks usually fail. Uh, this is called Sword Crafters. And I gotta say, I believe I remember backing this and then I pulled out of the my, my pledge and I'm like you know that's just gonna be stupid but I went to Gen Con that year and they were demoing it and they she he was showing me it and kind of explaining how how the game works and I'm like you know you know I'll pick this up this could be a lot of fun um because if you've watched my channel for any you know period of time you know at this point I'm very into very much like heavy strategy games but i also still love my storytelling but from time to time i really just don't i don't want to play those i just want to play some fun kind of party game and that's what sword crafters is as you can tell by the name you are crafting a sword and you are actually crafting a 3d sword so this is this is just 
you know, all types of fun for me because what you're doing is you essentially are laying out these tiles and you have these secret objectives where you, all the tiles have a colored gem on it. The gems are virtually meaningless. And the theme is that you're building like, like the ma the magic sword that protects the realm is has broken and you need to forge another one uh, and right before your kingdom is about to be slaughtered. Uh, so you have these tiles that are, you know, depending on number of players, they're, they're organized in a certain way. And on your turn, you basically cut, you, like you cut them, and then you split them into different groups. And each person can do that. And there's rules, of course, around how you can cut them. And everyone's trying to cut like the ore in a certain way. And then you draft what's remaining in piles. So you could have a cut in such a way that there's, you know, only two left and there's four left. And then there's like three left or, or two left, but also the first player marker. And you might be sitting there and you're like, oh man, that group of four right there is going to be perfect because you, like I said, you have these secret objectives that you want a certain number of, uh, like a certain type and a certain number of the gem colors uh, on this particular side or in total. And you also get points at the end of the game for the longest sword. And then you also have points for the thickest. Sword. That's not true. Uh, the longest sword thing is true. But you might be sitting there and you're like, oh man, those four are going to be perfect because those are all the colors I need to get my, you know, my large amount of points on my secret objective. But then someone could cut it and divide it into two. And you're like, dang it, which one do I want? So there's, there's a lot of, not really strategy, I guess, but there is kind of some, some element of, of strategy because you're sitting there and you're wanting specific ones. And then once you grab your tiles, then you place them because you start, everyone starts out with a hilt with a certain you know, types of types of gems, and then you slot them. And the cardboard is very durable. That was one of my concerns was that the game was going to be really thin and cheap. But no, the 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 tiles are really, really durable. And then the expansion brings like actual sword tips to it. So it does finally look like a, a sword. And it also adds monsters that you can go fight and kill with. I, I really like this gimmick. I think that there's enough like to think about without it being obviously like overburdened and like the game once again is very very quick you by the end of it here's the thing a lot of people tend to like games where they can look at their final product and be like oh i built this castles of mad king ludwig suburbia um what those two games are the ones that come to mind and you can sit there and be like oh yeah here's my weird castle here's my suburb but at the end they're just laying there this game, you get your final sword. You can actually hold your sword and be like, and you can fight each other and then, uh, and like go out in the yard and actually sort. No, you, you can't do that, but you could, I guess, but then that might weaken the durability of the pieces. I don't know. It worked for me. I think it's a lot of fun. I've still kept it because it's one of those games that, hey, I don't want to think too much, but let's play, let's play a game. I've done it for the channel if you want to see, uh, and yeah. Yeah, so that's my number nine, Sword Crafters. My number eight. I have not done a run through four. I totally meant to, but have not gotten around to it. Uh, it is 6,964, and it is called End of the Trail. So End of the Trail is kind of a light bluffing poker game. Uh, which makes it sound like it's like, okay, well, that just sounds horrible. It's, no, actually, that's what poker is, right? Bluffing? Um, well, because, so it's set in the, the gold rush, like, and the bluffing part doesn't really have anything to do with poker, but what you're doing is you have a hand of cards and you are trying to basically place, like, your people on these tiles, but you have certain cards that are going to have particular actions, but they also have uh, suits and things like that, so you are, whenever you're playing your cards, it's like, okay, I played this ace, and it has a horse on it. Well, the, the tiles are in rows of four, so it's like the first two, if you play, if it has like a mule on it, you can only look at those tiles because they're, they're face down. If you play a ox, you can go to the, to, to the third level. If you play a horse, you can go to any of them. And so what you're doing is on the bottom of these tiles, they have basically just a gold and a number. And you want to have the ones with the highest... Uh, the highest gold points because that's what you're going to get at the end of the game. Well, whenever you look at those, you could get like a, a two and you're like, hmm, well, 
I don't know if that's really that good. But if you play other, you can you can keep going. But if you if you reveal one that's lower than your the one you looked at previously, then you bust and you're like, well, dang it, like, like okay, I guess I then you have to basically stop and you can't claim any of the tiles. So you can hedge your bets and think, uh, okay, well that's a two. I, it goes up to six, so hmm, I think I'll wait. But you can act like that it is that it is higher than what it really is and you can kind of bait people into wanting to actually try and claim it or steal it from you because there's cards that you can actually move people's you know meeples around you can move their camps around and then that makes them claimable and or you can move them off of there so it's like if i claim like what a five then someone could be like hmm that's probably a really good one he jumped on that really quickly i'm gonna play this and move his tent over because now he's he, he's unclaimed on that one but the one i moved him to is is claimed so there is some element of, of strategy in trying to read other people and also fight for the highest highest tiles because at the end of the game, then whoever has the most gold, because they're going to get gold nuggets, uh, wins. But I mentioned poker. And with poker, whenever you are playing cards, you the cards that you've played, you pick one of them to go into like your side hand. And this is a, a hand that you don't mess with until the end of the game. So you're building a hand of a, a poker hand. So it ranges from, you know, one of a kind all the way to royal flush. And that's probably one of my favorite elements of the game because I like that there's the tactful, you know, claim tiles, trying, you know, dick over other people, but also you're secretly trying to build this hand. And then depending on the hands, like what you make, if I make a full house, that could be worth three extra gold nuggets or four. If I get a royal flush, that's going to be 10 gold nuggets. So you never know. So there's that extra element of like, hmm, what am I going to pay for? Like, cause you draft the cards that go into your hand. It's like, what do I want to fight for? That card is a jack of clubs and I don't need that to do anything with the board, but I really could use it to get a flush. Okay, I think I'll bid high to get that to get this this hand because I want those cards for my poker hand, and they also have some special abilities that I really like. It's a really neat game. Like I I will get it on the channel at some point, but I do like that the games are always relatively close. Like even if you don't go for the hand, like the poker hand at the end, like it's not like so much of a difference. Like you're not gaining ten gold nuggets for a poker hand. Like, a lot of it's going to come, so, like, I could get a really good poker hand, but someone could have grabbed, like, a six and a five off the tiles, and I only got ones. So, it's just really neat. I mean, theme-wise, there really isn't one. I really don't know why this is rated so low. I think probably because people didn't really, one, probably didn't hear about it. I know it went on Kickstarter, and clearly it funded, and there probably just wasn't enough to do, like, the there's not enough tiles to to have a whole bunch of variety, but... Like, I don't know, the game lasts 30 minutes. I think it's one of those games that's just fun to play. But maybe people just also don't like poker and have that weird poker thing, like, input, like forced into their game. Because really, those two, they really were like, Gold Rush? Well, that's Western. And people played cards back in those times, so poker. That's probably what they thought. I don't know. I like it. I don't think too much of the theme. And that's why it's my number eight, End of the Trail. My number seven is a game that I believe I've talked about at some top tens uh, quite a bit, and it's ranked to 3,810, and this is a very difficult cooperative game called Say Bye to the Villains. So Say Bye to the Villains is, like I mentioned, a cooperative game set in a Japanese theme where you're about to, your village is about to be attacked and you don't have enough time to have an army, so you need to ready like the, the locals, like the farmers and things like that. And what you do is each villain that is is there, they all have a special ability and they all have a stat on speed, attack, and health. And essentially what the speed means is, is whoever has the higher speed is going to like attack first. And whoever has, you know, the higher attack value, that's how much damage you're gonna do compared to the health. Well, if that was it, then the game would suck. But each of these cards has like or each of the villains has a certain number of like attribute cards like boost cards that are face down so you don't know what they can do but on your turn you have about 10 hours time so essentially 10 action points that you could do to get your hero ready 
to be able to fight one of the villains. So if there's three players, there's going to be three villains because each one will eventually have to assign themselves, be like, this is the one I'm fighting. And what's really cool about this game is there's ways to mitigate your 10 actions. So each card that you play, so for example, if I'm playing one character and his attack is, you know, his speed is one and his attack is three and his health is five, then it's like, okay, well, who can I fight? Well, this person's the slowest, this villain's the slowest, so we don't really have to boost my speed that much to, for me to fight him, but he's really strong and I don't have that much health. Well, you're gonna be able to play boost cards, and some of them are really radical, like, hey, this one costs four time, but it gives me infinite, you know, infinite health. So it's like, no matter how much he does, I will not die. But what happens is that one, once you're out of 10, like you as a person, then you're done. You can't do any more actions. So you have to then assign yourself and you have to hope that whatever you're doing, like you have to hope that, okay, if he goes first, can his attack kill me? And if it can't, then great, because then I'll just attack back. Can, and if my, can my attack kill him? If you can't do either, then it's a stalemate. And what happens is how you win the game is you each have to kill your villain, potentially. But that's really the ultimate, is like you have to each at least defeat your villain in some way. But I mentioned that there's face down cards and these cards will like could give them weird attributes where it's like, hey, like let's say I signed and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm faster than him, I'm stronger and I have enough, I have enough strength to be able to kill him. Well, he might have a face down card that says this villain cannot be killed. And if you kill him, then you lose. So that's what makes this game very, very difficult. But there's ways for you to play cards to look at or reveal, you know, the face down ones. So you can actually slowly start being like, okay, well, this is the knowledge we have. So actually, because of that and the, and the way I've built my character, I shouldn't fight him. I should fight this guy, but you can fight him. And that will, that will allow us the, the better chance of victory. So you're trying to figure out the face down cards and you're trying to utilize your 10 action points to make the best of what you got based off the cards in your hand. And what I mean is like, probably this one flew into the, I think this, yeah, this was made by AEG, is this probably just got no buzz. Like the say bye to the villains, okay? Like it's a small box game, all right? And the game can be very, very lucky. Like you, there's been games that I've had, the first time I played it, the group I was playing with had never won before. And we were doing really well. And it was just one of those things where, like, you can't ever look at all of the face down cards. So I remember we all were assigned where we were all like 100% sure, but they flip over the one card and it's like, this person can't be killed. And they killed him. And it's like, well, it doesn't matter what you've done for the rest of the, you know, for, for the others, the fact that you killed him and he wasn't supposed to, that causes you to lose. And I can definitely see why some people would really not like that at all. Um, I don't know. I think it's just, it, once again, it's a short game. It's a game you don't take too seriously. There is a lot of cooperation because you can trade cards with someone. You can play cards for someone else. Uh, there's a lot of cohesion with the players and trying to figure out. And you're, like I said, you're not going to look at all the face down cards, but you can probably find ones that are really good. But there are some that it's like, hey, when looked at, you flip it and it's like a, a you know, a negative modifier or you can just flip it and know, oh, okay, so he's getting infinite you know, attack, or he's getting a boost of 10 to his attack. Well, okay, so how can we kill him? Because right now he's sitting on a 20. Who? okay. Well, I have a card that allows, that gives me infinite uh, health, so, but it costs five of my 10. So, okay, I can fight him because he's not going to kill me. It's just neat. I, I believe there were talks of other iterations of this, but they never, they never came, probably because this game didn't do too well. Uh... Because I've never seen anyone. I actually I don't even remember how I got my copy, but it's also pretty difficult to find. I mean, three thousand, almost four thousand ranking. Well, that's like the four thousandth game, so give or take a few. Because there's kind of some duplicates within the board game geek listing. So I don't know. I like it. I don't take it too seriously. It's a fun cooperative game, and when you do beat it, it's it's pretty it's pretty exciting. So that's my number seven. Say bye to the villains. My number six is another game I haven't done for the channel, and it's because I did basically its other version for the channel, and this is Exceed Red Horizon. So kind of pick any type of Exceed group, because each, there were like, I believe four boxes, and they all came with four, four like fighters. This is basically BattleCon, the card game, and that's like, and, but it's, but it's quicker. 
And I like Exceed. I like Exceed quite a bit because I really like Battlecon. And so in Exceed, it's laid out almost the exact same way. Like you have, you know, your fighter as as a card, uh, like it on on a spot. Same with like a fighter on theirs, and then you're moving around this this. It's not a board, but you're moving around these the the arena, I guess, uh, trying to fight one another, similar to how Battlecon works. So your your hero has like their power, their range, their speed, and things like that, and their and their yeah, I said their power. Uh, same as your your opponent, and what you're doing is you have a deck of cards. So everyone has like their hero's unique unique cards, and they also have like their generic ones, like punch, kick, jab, block, things like that. And but what you're doing is you're you actually will shuffle this deck and then have a hand of cards, and then you're playing you're playing them like like you would kind of except you're playing them for one like instead of making a a match like you would in Battlecon. And in Battlecon, like no one knows exactly what's in your deck, and no one knows exactly what's in your hand. So there is that random editor where, other unlike in Battlecon, you have almost perfect information because you can see the two pairs that they've done. So you can look at it and be like, okay, here's what I know that they have left, and you could try and you know think of what they most likely would do in this scenario. But this one was really interesting. I felt actually this one might be more exhilarating because of that element. You have your hand of cards, and you're playing them. And what's really cool is you can play these and put them in kind of like a meter stack that you can then spend to do other actions. Like it's kind of like uh, like in Mortal Kombat, the new one, how you get like that boost meter that lets you spend those to do be like better attacks of like, like if you're Scorpion, you can spend like two meters and you shoot out two spears instead of the one, so you do more damage. And you have these ultra attacks that you can spend a bunch of your, you know, your, your meter cards to do your ultimate attack. Or you just have to have it, and yeah, like I said, you spend it. And it's really, really cool. Like, I, if you like Battlecon, you're most likely gonna like Exceed Red Horizon. Uh, well, I know, I have a feeling, and here's the thing. <laughs> Exceed, I feel like didn't take off quite as much as Battlecon. And the reason why I feel like is because people like that perfect information of like, Okay, I know exactly what you could be doing. I know I don't know what you're gonna do, but I know what your options are. Versus like, well, you don't know what's in my hand. Like the, my deck is my deck, and so you don't know what cards I've drawn. You don't know what cards. I mean, you know what cards I've played, but at the same time, so you don't know what I can do. So it's more you're definitely guessing a lot more with your plays. But I feel like it's quicker. It's fast placed. You don't have to make pairs of attacks that might not even work. You might have two cards where you're like this attack sucks. You you always just have the one. Um, it works the exact same way, but what's really neat is there's ways, so your hero actually has two sides. One is like their regular side and that has like their special ability and then two, you flip it to their other side and it's like a overpowered like kind of exceed, like you exceed the limits of your, of your hero and now they're like this super saiyan fucking badass on, on the field. So it's like, I don't even remember like one of the heroes it's like if your hero could reach range one to three, now they can reach range one to one to six or something. I mean, that's a really lame ability, and I don't think that's real at all. But that's kind of like the idea. Is like now they're they're buffed, and now they can do what they need to. So like they have a lot of really cool heroes, like uh, like Battlecon. So in fact, I don't think anyone. Yeah, there's no one in Exceed that is in Battlecon. To my knowledge, I'm pretty sure there's not. They were all unique and different, which I appreciated because otherwise it's like just make Battlecon the card game, which Battlecon is already a card game. Um, but what they've also done with Exceed, which I think is pretty cool, is they've implemented a lot more IPs into it. Like Shovel Knight is is like one of theirs. I believe Street Fighters is in their Exceed system and things like that. And that's kind of where I believe it calls for because you can do a lot of re really neat things with, and I like card-based one v one, like Magic: The Gathering one v one. Actually, I like. Uh, oh God, I already forgot. A commander, that's kind of my thing. So it's multiplayer, but Sorcerer, for example, um, and there's actually gonna be one one more coming up soon. Of that's a one v one card game. But this one, if you like Battlecon, you're gonna like this. It. I don't know if I mentioned it. It's at three thousand five hundred and sixty nine. I would imagine this might go up because of the IPs, uh, and Battlecon right now, they're actually about to uh, hopefully get done 
with their with their uh, big big BattleCon collector set that they went on Kickstarter for. But right now they're releasing Exceed stuff, and it's really cool. Like you can just buy a pack and have the four the four heroes and just fight with those four. Uh, what sucks really the most about this is there's no storage system. So if you buy the other packs, then the way they come out is like in like this little tray that you just slide out, and that's it. It's a very skinny, thin tray. It's it's horrible, and so there's not a whole real way. And the the, the deck or the the set that I bought had a holographic like special cards, which were really neat, but they had that material where they bowed, you know, like because that's what holo cards tend to do, and that was extremely obnoxious because then you couldn't like. You couldn't like sit your deck right because you could tell where the boat. It was just awful. Uh, but the gameplay is exactly like BattleCon. If you want a one v one kind of Street Fighter Mortal Kombat ass game uh, with that's quick paced and and with some some you know unique decks, this is going to be for you. So that's my number six. Exceed Red Horizon. My number five is the other one v one. I card game that I was talking about. Funny enough, this is another level 99 game. Uh, Cause Cell Swords is level 99, Exceed is level 99, and this one at 6,988 is actually really disappointing that it's this, this far back on the list because I really like this game. And it is Temporal Odyssey. Now this game came out in 2018, so a couple years ago, and I'm I'm hoping and I like I feel like it's also lower because it hasn't gotten any support. They haven't announced any expansions. I talked to the designer and asked him if he planned on supporting and he said yes, so I'm hoping that it gets more expansions. But this is a really, really cool theme. Basically you are dueling time travelers. And what you're doing is like you have your unique time traveler and kind of his stronghold. And what you're doing is you are going to be drafting cards from the past, present, and future. And there's different types, like, of what could be in the past, present, and future. Like, the past could be, I don't know, knights. The, mo the, the present could be assassins. And then the future could be robots. And whenever you have a certain number of, or certain types, like a collection combination, I guess, of those three different decks, you're going to get a combination of different cards that you can play. But what you're doing is whenever you're playing your cards down, one, there's going to be certain spells that you can cast against one another, depending on the elements that are shown on the cards that you have played. And you can also, the warriors that you're fighting, is you put them in like kind of a stack, not really a stack, but a line. And whenever you have a person in front, he's the only one that can attack, and then the one behind him can't. And so you're sitting there trying to des uh, decide how you want to layer out your warriors, because... You're trying to attack their other their other um, time traveler, and whenever they die, they don't come like they don't. The game's not over. Whenever they die, they actually come back with kind of a uh, a paradox card. But what's neat about this is the paradox card gives you an element, a symbol, which then now you can you can have that boosts your other spells. But it's also that's kind of your your timer, and it's, I believe it's the first one to kill the, the time traveler who has three, because that's kind of like you messing with time. Like you die, but you're a time traveler, so you come back and you're like, oh, haha, -ha, see, mess with time, I actually didn't die. But they all have one-time special abilities that you can use and you'll turn it over, which will give you some unique ability in that moment, but you also will lose your glyph that's gonna power up your spell. So you have that to think about. And then, so whenever you kill someone who is actually, who has more than, they, they need and then they die, then actually, I can't remember what, what his name was, but basically the master of time, the, the god behind all that, wipes you from existence because you've messed with time too much. I think that's a really cool theme. I love the different deck types from past, present, and future that adds a lot of uh, thematic elements. I love the different, or like the unique way that you battle one another, of like you have your stronghold that can do something, you have like your, you know, your time traveler that can do something unique. You have these really cool, like one of them is like an assassin. And if you attack an unguarded time traveler, it does more damage because he's unguarded. You can have things that heal others on your team. There's a lot of awesome combinations. And that's why, like, I can, I guess I can see why this is so low because 
no one probably heard anything about it. Like they, I mean, I know they sell they sell the play mat that I I have, and I guess they just didn't really promote it all that much, which is a shame because I really like this game. I really want more content, more expansions, because the only thing I didn't really care for about it was that the time travelers weren't all that unique. Their their strongholds that they start with aren't all that unique. Like they, I think one guy out of the base game actually comes with something. His stronghold does something different, and I think they need more variety. That they, they want to, they need to give you a reason to play like a certain character. Hell, even they could just do a small pack that gives each each hero some unique. Like, hey, here's five cards that goes into into your hand or your deck or whatever that allows your character to be unique and play something play completely different um i wouldn't mind new past present and future faction decks that would be really cool so who knows like level 99 seems to be kind of one of those i mean they're doing a lot of stuff expansions with exceed their battle con is just that's like their world so that's they're just really going all out for that one they have millennium blades that's another massive collector set they're doing so Funny enough, I think they're all the first board game I think I've seen was the Empyreal Spells and Steam or something. That was kind of that was a board game. Uh, Cell Swords is a card game. They seem to do card games. Funny enough, now that I think about it. So who knows? But uh, if you really want a unique themed head to head that it does play different, like like a lot of head to head card games, definitely check out Temporal Odyssey. I think I think that it might be it might be something you're looking for if you're tired of the generic one v one. So that's my number five, Temporal Odyssey. My number four, funny enough, is another card game. This one just broke the cusp of being over 3,000 at 3,055. Uh, the reason I know the reason why this is so high, and I guarantee you it's not because it's a card game. It's going to be because of the guy P. And that is Dark Souls, the card game. Now, I have done a run-through for Dark Souls, the board game, and a run-through for Dark Souls, the card game. And... I prefer the card game and not be so it's interesting the boss battles of the board game were the best part of that entire thing I think they should have just gone balls to the wall and and just done that because and now that I and at the time I didn't play Dark Souls but I knew I was like oh I know the IP now I wish I'd kept it solely just for those minis because I just to have them would be cool but the grind for getting to the boss was just awful. It was it was horrible. I hated it. Um, it was way better as a solo game, I will say that, because you're not sharing souls, which makes sense. You don't share souls when you... I mean, if you, you, if you play with another player in Dark Souls, you both get the same amount of souls. But the card game, I thought, was a really interesting... It's a deck builder. And what you're doing is that you're going through and you, it's basically you're on this grid, this three by, this two by three grid, um, same with the enemies and kind of where you place yourself, you move around this and that's your arena. And then you have the monsters that get placed in certain areas. And whenever they attack, they attack certain spaces of the board. And some of the bosses will do area effects. Others will do, um, like we'll attack certain area, like certain certain spots, and if you're playing with other people, which I actually didn't mind, I think two is the max you should play this game with. But you can kind of get in each other's way, so you kind of want to maneuver around, and it's like, hey, this they're about to attack and do and attack this. I can't take a whole lot of damage because what your damage is, it's going to be your deck, and so it's like I'm most likely going to die. So can you take the hit for me? But the reason why I like this so much was because. The, the way you deck build is as you gather souls, you spend them on unique on unique cards that work uh, like really well for your character. And you can actually mitigate what you're buying because you have a, a bigger option of, of cards that you're going to be putting into your deck. But also how you do cards, like weapons, actually have different ways that you can attack, which is really interesting. So like the first one, it's like, hey, if you just do this type of attack and spend a one strength because you, your currency is like your attribute cards. So you'll have ones that are going to be faith or intelligence or strength or dex and a certain amount of those that you can spend. Hey, if you want to do the really high powered attack that's going to do five damage, you need to spend two strength cards and a dex and an and intelligence or something like that. So you, if you have those in your hand, you spend those four, you do five damage to whatever you're attacking. But you can only attack basically uh, in the row in front of you. 
But what's really cool is, like I said, so if you do the big powered one, then you discard that card. And it's like, okay, well, I use that. But if you use the lighter one, then you can actually put it back into your hand. And it's like, okay, well, the lighter one just does two damage, and I don't have to spend any cards for it. So I think I'll just keep using that. I really like that element. I like the deck building hand management aspect of this game. Uh, I love the streamlined nature. There's no, there is kind of a grind, but it's not so much. They are constantly like in, in the board game, you are constantly just finding the same things over and over. And I understand that the video game does this. I get it. But in a board game, it takes way longer to do. Like in a in a in a video game in Dark Souls, you just go to a bonfire, boom, they respawn. And you just go out immediately and and fight and kill them again, and then you can spend your souls a lot quicker. I mean, since everything's manual with a board game, you have to reset everything up, you have to flip everything, and it was just it was just awful. Um, but here, like you don't have to go as far on the track to be able to go fight one of the bosses. And I felt like the bosses were unique too. Like they don't have like your big named ones in this yet. They have the butterfly. They have I'm not gonna remember any of them. They have I believe the gargoyles. They have the one of the ones that have the he has the hands. I don't remember any of the bosses' names off the top of my head right now. If it was Bloodborne, I would. But uh, the bosses are unique. Oh, uh, the the wolf. The wolf. Sig? Sig, I think is what it's called. Oh, man. Sif? No. No. The wolf. You can fight him. So, they've made an expansion for it, which added, like, terrain and other, other like, traps that kind of add a little bit more element to the game, which is, which is perfectly fine. I just really liked how streamlined this game was and how it didn't just, it didn't feel tedious. It didn't feel as grindy as the board game. So, if you... And I and I, from what I understand, they actually someone released a like an errata or like a homebrewed rule set to the board game that a lot of people are saying makes it better. That's fantastic. I think that's really cool. Uh, I just want the board game for the minis. I, I don't think I'll ever go back and play it. But yeah, if you want a streamlined Dark Souls game, check out the card game. It might it might scratch that itch. But that's my number four, Dark Souls the card game. My number three is another type of light-hearted kind of party game sitting at 4,213. And this is a heist game called The Big Score. Big Score was done by Van Ryder Games, which kind of put them on the map for me a little bit. Now, because I played this one and then they released Detective City of Angels, I was like, who is this company? And I remember they released another game called Hostage Negotiator a while back. And I'm like, oh, it's a solo game. Well, this was years ago. And I was like, oh, that's not going to be for me. Well, I went out and bought everything from their latest Kickstarter because I just trust this company. And if you want a fun push-your-luck uh, game, check out the big score. So there's two parts to this game. The first part is you have these small high. So a small bank, a grocery store, and things like that. And what you're doing is you're drafting certain people that you want to hire. Like you want a driver, you want a computer hacker, you want a... A security guard you're drafting for these and you're gonna eventually have a lot of these kinds of people in your hand because each small heist you want a certain number of people so hey to go after the bank we need two drivers three computer hackers and a whatever a ventriloquist no, not a ventriloquist a uh oh god what do they call them i'll just say a security guard you want those and then each of them will have some. And then if those conditions are met, everyone who submitted and, and participated in that heist will get a, a bonus. And so you're sitting here and you're assigning these cards. So you have these to these tokens that say one to six and they're only secret to you. Everyone has the same numbers, of course, uh, but they're secret to you and you're secretly assigning of where you want to go. So you kind of have to read, well, what do, what, what do my opponents want? What do I want the most? Because that's where, like, I want number five the most. I want that reward more than anything here. So I'm going to make sure it succeeds. But do I also think that the other players want that one as well? Because if it doesn't matter how well you succeed by, if you just get all of the, like, all the people there, then great. So it's like, okay, if I want number five, does Cat also want number five? So you kind of have to hedge your bets and think into the minds of your opponents 
and then be like, okay, I'm not going to put all my eggs in one basket. I'm going to put most of them for number five, but I'm going to put at least one for number one, and then my other three into number three. And you'll secretly choose the tokens and put them on there. And then once everyone has done the signing, then you'll just go down the road. Be like, okay, who went to number one? And here's the kicker. If you, if you go, if you assigned cards to a section and it doesn't succeed, then you get penalized for it. Like, it's like you got, you got caught. So you're sitting there and you're like, oh man, I hope, I hope someone assigned. And then you could sit there and, okay, well, I went to number one and I signed two cards. I need one more. No one else went. Oh no. Or like, who did you assign? Like, okay, well, I signed two drivers to number one. And that meets the driver criteria, but I'm really hoping someone puts a security guard and the other person went to number one and they also put a driver and you're like, oh no, we don't have a security guard. There is mitigation for it. You have tokens that you can now, you can reveal and basically, or you can, everyone puts their token in their hand and they decide like they'll reveal and if they have it, then it adds like a random person. So you, if you're like, let's say I put two drivers and I needed a security guard there or a bodyguard, sorry, then I could be like, Okay, me and the other person, okay, well, I'm going to use mine so I succeed, and then we both get the rewards. It's really neat. Like, that, that so you do that for all six, and then you, you'll, have your, you'll have your bonuses, and those are going to be what you keep, like, for sure, by the end of the game. It's like, this is what you're going to have. And I mentioned that there's two parts. Well, the first part is fun because you kind of have more of a game here. You're trying, to, you're, you're trying to read your opponents and assign cards. That's fun. The second part is what makes this game a blast, and this is the push your luck aspect. So they kind of went overkill, is they have a magnetized, like, box, and the box, I, like, it looks like a giant bank. It's like a, it's, this is the big heist. All the other ones were small heists, but this is the big mama, the big baboom. And it has all these tokens in, in it, and but it also has a, a number of security, like police tokens that you don't want to pull. So what you'll do is you'll reach in and you'll you'll decide to grab some like grab one token or none. If you grab none, then you're saying, hey, I'm out. Whatever I have, this is mine, I leave. But this is where you can push your luck because then you can keep grabbing. Okay, well I grab a token. Great, it's it's a diamond that's worth a thousand. Or it's a uh, a lock and I happen to have like a a safe that I, you need the lock for that lets you unlock it and that's gonna give you five thousand money or whatever. But depending on the number of players, there is a certain number of like police tokens that can be drawn. And so, and everyone will do stuff like that. Everyone will reach in and pretend to grab one and then reveal. And then it's like, oh, okay, two police badges were drawn and we only need three. Ugh. Well, so then everyone, like someone can draw and then like show an empty hand and be like, okay, no, I'm done. But if you grab something, that means you're still in for the heist. So even though there's one police token badge left, that that could be drawn oh man like you could keep drawing and keep drawing and just you can just keep racking it up and everyone who already passed will see you slowly just gain more and more money and you're just risking you're just like oh my god wonder is this gonna be the one and if it is if you you could pull out any time but if you do draw it and then the number of police tokens you lose everything that you gathered from that heist uh you still keep your your small heist stuff but it's it's such a blast and i don't know why it's so like at four thousand like i mean at the same time like is four thousand really that bad in the sheer amount of games that are coming out lately uh i don't know it just seems like it's pretty high i feel like no one's talking about this game and it's a it's a lot of fun like if once again it's a game you don't take too seriously it's a game that if you i love push your luck games like if they're done right. Like, I don't like strategy games where you can also push your luck. Like, I don't like those. But the the Beer and Pretzels games, those are just so much fun. And I like that there's two parts, but the game is not overly complicated. It makes it seem like it. The rules, it's like, wow, this is going to be a complicated game. But it's not at all. It, if you, if you want to push your luck, heist game. Like, I can't think of any other ones that are heist themed. Check out Big Score. And that's why it's my number three. My number two hurts my feelings a lot because this game has been discontinued. Not discontinued. Uh, they basically announced that they're not doing any more expansions. And I hate this company now. It's just, they're, I mean, not just for that, for that reason, but it just seems like, 
it just seemed like they're going downhill. But this game is fantastic, and I'm probably the only one advocating its greatness because I want it to gain popularity because I want it to start releasing expansions. At 5,277, it is Guardians. I've talked about this game before. I believe it actually made my top 10 of 2018. It, I, it's just, it's so much fun. This is, once again, another head-to-head -head game where you play as a, a team of three, not really heroes, but three powered-up individuals. And this is basically Overwatch, the card game, like, almost to a T, because you have your you have your three heroes and you're all trying to vie for control over certain areas and everyone has their own unique special ability everyone has their own unique you know cards that are getting shuffled into one deck as well as your generic ones that are going to let you draw more or heal someone or things like that but like you take each three hero special cards and shuffle them in and every single hero has an ultimate that if you're playing certain cards, you basically can charge up, and then as an action on your turn, you can spend the required number of charges to do their special ability. And what you're doing is you're basically going to certain locations and fighting the other the other people. And everyone has health. Everyone has like their speed. You you can tap them to use their special ability. You can tap them to attack, and then okay, well I kill them. So if you kill someone in that base, then it moves like it's kind of a tug of war element with the individual bases and if you kill someone at that base then it moves and there's a certain phase where it's like you vie for strength where it's like okay so i have a hero there you have a hero there the marker's not moving but if i go to this one that has no one there and you leave me you leave me there then boom it's going to start coming my way each base <clears throat> excuse me each base has like their own special ability that makes the bases unique which is also something to keep in mind but I don't know. I don't know. And I even asked the designer if he I'm like, hey, have you played Overwatch? And he says, yeah. And so he, he was inspired by Overwatch to make this game. But the sheer variety of the different heroes and what make them unique, the special abilities, the badass powers. Because like whenever your heroes die, they're not out of the game. They just spawn right back. But you're collecting these bases. And I don't remember the number you need to collect because they have a point value. So like... You can go for the really easy ones that, that are not too hard to take over, but they're only worth one point. Or you can try and fight for the ones that are worth three. And I think it's first one to eight. Eight or nine. And might not even be either one of those. But first one to collect that amount of points is, is the winner. But you can get so many cool combos from the three heroes that you have. And they did release one hero pack that added, I don't remember how many, but added more heroes. And so that just increased the variety. Like if you want, there's a guy, I think his name's Harbinger. I believe he cannot move except by special cards. Like because the other people, they can just move from like adjacent base to adjacent base. Um, he can't, he has to have special cards, but his attack is so high and he has these badass like missile power cards that would just do a shit ton of damage, but you have to be able to move him. But you could have someone that allows him to move, gives him the ability to do so. Or you can have someone that is a sniper that can hit at bases that are adjacent to the one that she's at. There's one that, you know, gives poison tokens to to the other enemies, which prevent them from healing or just deal a damage to them as long as they have it on there. You have, uh, I mean, you can kind of tell that, oh, hey, this is kind of that Overwatch character. This was reminding me of that particular one. I don't know. Like, this was, this one just... I mean, clearly they quit. They they quit and it, releasing expansions because they were like, "Oh, well, we're not making any money off of it." And I remember someone commenting on my run through. I've done a run through for uh, Guardian, so definitely go check it out. But I remember he was like, "Look, this game is good. Definitely has Overwatch vibes." But would you have ever picked it up off the shelf uh, by just seeing the name Guardians? And he's right. I wouldn't. The name is super generic. The cover is not the best looking. It, it just shows the heroes really on it. They're not doing really anything cool. Um, but the gameplay, it's like, it's so slick. And I love the combos of the different the different heroes. The ultimate, it's just, it sings for me. I'm a huge fan of Overwatch. Not Blizzard as a company, they're pretty shitty. But Overwatch is at least a really fun game. I actually just played it not too long ago. And after months, because I go through these stints of like, Overwatch where I play it for months on end and then I don't play it for like a year. It's weird But I just get I was reminded of how synergistic 
that your team comp needs to be because I was playing a lot of Rainbow Six Siege and I'm like, oh, it doesn't really matter who's on your team. Like, it, we're not really going to be having that, that team comp. But Overwatch relies on it, especially in competitive, that you that you just got that from this game and the heroes were 100% unique from one another. It just It's a really cool game. Definitely check it out if you want a fun Overwatch-style head-to-head card game. And that's my number two, Guardians. And my number one always has a soft space, a soft a soft spot in my heart. Uh, it's actually the highest like ranked one, meaning the one that's lowest. <laughs> and I've been talking about this game's greatness for years since it actually first appeared on my channel as a prototype, as a preview. It's been on multiple top tens. Like they just succeeded in making an expansion for it. So I hope it gets a lot more love. I hope I'm doing it any justice. And that is Overlords of Infamy. This is ranked 8,426. This is so far down the list of where I went to. Like everything, I had one, two, three, four, four that were in the 3,000s. One in the 4,000s. Uh, one, two in the 5,000s. And two in the 6,000s. And then one in the 8,000s. So like... Everything was, well, actually I had, a, I had a pretty good spread, uh, but Overlords of Infamy is such a fantastic, whimsical, funny, unique worker placement game. And this theme is you are playing an Overlord, like kind of like think, think Megamind or think Gru from Despicable Me, where you are a villain, but you're not like, you're just kind of, you do like stupid shit. And the whole point of the worker placement game is you have your own section of the board. And in the middle, there's the, the kingdom of good. But you have your own little, you know, headquarters area. And you have your lackeys, which are your meeples. And you, dev you know, you tear up the landscape, which you're basically drawn from a stack and placing. These are going to be your resources. And you send your lackeys out to get your resources to complete nefarious plots. And there's three different types of nefarious plots from knavery to, I don't remember the... Uh, I don't remember the middle one. The middle one's the one I always forget. And then you have like the do the domination plots, and those are the really advanced ones that actually change the way the game works. Because the knavery ones are just really they're like basic level villain stuff. That if it happened, it would just be a mild inconvenience. It really wouldn't affect like anyone too much. But people would definitely notice something's going on. Like the one that comes to mind is like make everyone's socks wet. It's like okay <laughs> it doesn't okay you made them one socks wet. that's not going to cripple or cost it might just be like god this sucks but that's kind of the theme and humor around this game but so you're trying to gather like certain types of resources that that have something to do with what the the title of the plot is and then you just spend your resources and you complete your plot and then you go up on your do you know your nefarious track that shows how evil you get and that track indicates what types of of plot oh wait i think it's Knavery, nope, I, I don't remember the middle one. Totally drawn a blank. Anyway, that indicates the types of plots that you can take. So whenever you complete one, you can sit there and be like, oh, okay, I'm going to, uh, now that I'm at level three, I can take another Knavery, which is gonna be easy. So you can you can try and go for the really easy ones and complete a whole bunch, or you can try and do the, the next tiered ones, which are a little bit harder to get. You might need some relics, which are in the Kingdom of Good, and you might need a little more resources, but you're gonna get more points for it. Or you can go for the top tiered three ones, which are going to be a lot of points, require you to have a lot of stuff, and you're not going to complete a whole bunch of those, but they're going to give you a special ability that you can use when you complete them. And those are really fun, and those are like the really, like, blow up the moon is kind of stuff that, or steal the moon, like from Despicable Me. Things like that. Those are the, the, the ones you really want to go for, but it's such a solid worker placement game. Like, because, here's the thing is a lot of worker placement game is you share spots between people. Well, your section is really the only one that you can go to unless you, you like, destroy the land to where, because the way the board displays, you have the kingdom of good, and then you have these lines, which are, which are, these are like shared resources, that if you place tiles next to that, and your opponent plays tiles next to that, because you kind of are, are neighbors, then you can do acts of espionage against one another, which depending on your level is which ones you can do. And one of them is like, oh, now I can go over into your spot. But they can, you know, kill your kill your lackeys. They can do an action to kill them, which just wipes them. And now you have to hire more. 
Uh, but you can risk that. You can just have them go over in there because it's like, huh, I'm really not getting any cow tiles, but you have some, so I need cows for this plot, so I'm just going to send my people over there. You can also do like uh, like one of the acts of espionage is, is like sabotage where you put like a black disc on their plot and when they complete it, they have to roll a die and if they roll a certain result, it just fails. They have to spend all the resources, but it still fails. This game can be very dickish to one another. You're not going to be doing it a lot, but you, uh, like, that's just kind of where you can sabotage one another. Because most of the, most of the time, what your, what your land is looking like, that's that's what you got. Um, but the other way to dick one another is, like I mentioned, there's the kingdom of good. There is a hero of that kingdom that after a certain, like, the, the round track hits a certain spot, then the player gets to roll and then move him in a certain way. And if he moves, so if he lands on a tile that's been excavated, that tile goes away. If he lands on a spot with a, uh, a meeple, like a lackey, that lackey dies. If he lands on a spot with resources, he takes those resources back. And so now, if he's in there, he's protecting you know the kingdom. But if he's ever gone, you can, if you ever put tiles next to the kingdom, then you can spend actions to ransack and get a bunch of resources. Or you can get, that's how you get your relics. But that's also going to leave you open because if you never go to the shared lines, the shared resources, but both of you are connected to the kingdom of good, then you both can do acts of espionage against one another. This game, this game just sings theme, fantastic worker placement game, hilarious as hell. Uh, the designer of it is a good friend of mine. Like so, he was one of the few. Like when I started my channel, when I had like probably 50 fucking subscribers, they sent me a review copy to do it. And granted. I probably didn't do the best review because I was still new on my channel, but then whenever it came out, I did another run through for it, and I've been singing its praises ever since, not because I have any bias, I honestly think this game is fantastic and severely, severely underrated. Very excited for their expansion, like, it has a solo mode in, in the game, it's just, it's so good. And then you have world, world events that are just hilarious and devastating as well, that once the tracker, and that's, that's the timer, is once that the time tracker reaches 10, then a world event goes off and that's after a certain number of those, but there's a huge stack. It's just, and the best part of the whole, the whole goddamn game is one of the villains, one of the, one of the uh, overlords is a corgi named Waffles. So, boom, there you go. I should have just said that. Like, I really, I mean, ignore everything else I just said. Just, you can play a corgi, a sentient corgi. And you want to know why he's sentient? Because one of the relics, the king, he used to be the the, the, the hero, the, the adventuring hero, used to be his dog, and but he was always gone on adventures and leaving the dog alone. And then he eventually came back with a bone that the dog ate, which made him sentient. And then he's like, hey, fuck you, man. You keep leaving me. I hate you now. So now I'm going to go run this evil empire and, uh, you know, whatever, whatever, like, destroy the world's entire chocolate supply. So... And they're just clever. That's the thing. It's like they're not. Some of them are like really stupid, like the sock one, which is still funny. But some of them are really clever and really smart. So, yeah, you can play a Tyrannosaurus Rex that is like a gentleman. You can play some little kid that's stuck in a suit of armor, and they all have these uh, elaborate backstories that just make them really funny. And this game is so good. I I really can I like once once I realized how far it was at eight thousand. I was like number one immediately. That's the most under the radar game that I've ever played. But that's it, everyone. Those are my top eleven under the radar games ranked from three thousand to ten thousand. Let me know what you think of the games that I talked about in the comments below, or games that you think are uh, severely underrated as well. Other than that, like, comment, share, and subscribe, and have a wonderful whatever time of day it is for you. Hey everyone, thank you for watching and I really hope that you enjoyed the video. If you would like to see more of my content, go ahead and click that subscribe button and the bell to be notified whenever I upload any new content. If you feel like supporting the channel, you can go ahead and click that Patreon link to be taken to my Patreon and any help is truly appreciated. Other than that, stick around for any, any other run-throughs or reviews or cool top tens or whatever I feel like putting on. Other than that, like, comment, share, and subscribe and have a wonderful whatever time of day it is for you.